Hello everybody, Joel Tabman here from Golf Monthly. I hope you're well and staying safe. And welcome to this video where we're gonna be talking about the 12 hottest gear trends you can expect to see in 2021. This is both at amateur level, but also some of the trends we're seeing at tour level as well. Hopefully you find it really interesting to hear about what's going on in terms of the world of equipment and what we can expect to see more of in 2021. It's a conversation between myself and Kit Alexander, we're going to be talking about six trends each to give you a really good insight into those areas. And, you know, if we have missed any glaring trends you think could be happening in 2021, make sure you comment on this video down below and tell us what we've missed. Uh, but without further ado, let's get started covering off the 12 hottest equipment trends you can expect to see in 2021. Right, okay, so Kit, uh, we're talking about the 12 hottest gear trends of 2021. Why don't you kick us off with your first one? Okay, I've got a going hot with the trend that everyone's after. It's distance, it's power, and it's that we are going to see more 48-inch drivers on tour. As we all know, Bryson DeChambeau was talk of him putting it in at Augusta for the Masters last year. Didn't quite happen. Callum Shinkwin on the European tour, the Englishman, he has put a 48-inch driver in play. I think we're more than likely to see Bryson's at some point, perhaps at Augusta in April, and more and more guys are following suit. All of the equipment reps and people I speak to on tour say virtually every player that they work with is at least trialling longer drivers behind the scenes. So I think we're going to see them on tour. Uh, it's been absolutely legitimised by what Bryson's done with a longer driver. So I think they're here to stay. Definitely. I think, you know, with modern drivers becoming more and more forgiving, yeah, that offset in the dispersion that might be a slightly wider with a longer shaft is kind of offset by the extra forgiveness you get from the modern driver. And so maybe we're not going to see loads of 48-inch drivers, but I think we'll see players adding half an inch, maybe a full inch, just to gain a little bit of speed while being able to, able to control that dispersion. So, yeah, that's a really good start kit. I 100% agree that we're going to see longer drivers on tour and maybe two drivers as well, as we saw with, with yeah. Callum Shinkwin. Okay, so my first one, Kit, is more free agents on tour. And this, we're seeing a slight trend, I would say, towards players realising and understanding the benefits of having the freedom to play the clubs you want in order to play your best. You know, especially with COVID, maybe brands being a bit more tight-pocketed in terms of splashing the cash on big contracts. There are some exceptions to the rule. You know, we've just seen John Rahm sign with Callaway. I'm sure that was a fairly lucrative deal, but... Yeah, Brooks Kepka is a classic example of a player who's really accelerated the trend of choosing to play whatever he wants, no deals in place, and actually having some really good success with it. And I think that really should trump any kind of endorsement deals that players are offered. And actually, we've seen some players sign deals, you know, Justin Rose, Sergio Garcia, for example, you know, uh, Honma and uh, Callaway, respectively, and they've since gone back to their old equipment. So I think there is a lot of merit in, you know, not necessarily or well, letting your on-course monies and earnings kind of field your field your income rather than taking those endorsement deals yeah absolutely you're a professional golfer your golf clubs are your tools and you should absolutely be getting the ones that you want in each area of the bag if you can get that from one manufacturer and get a nice big check to go with it then great but i think in, in most golfers cases they're going to want that bit of flexibility through the entire bag and we are starting to see that definitely more and more i'm going to come in with something aimed more at the amateurs actually now and that's having more wedges in your bag because you know it's been happening for a while now pitching wedges and irons in general have been getting stronger and longer now, I'm not going to debate whether that's a good or a bad thing, but that's the fact of the matter. If your pitching wedge is suddenly going 130, perhaps 135 yards through the air, and it used to go 115 to 120, you now have a much larger gap at the bottom of the bag. And also think about your last round of golf. It might be a long time ago if you're in the UK in lockdown, but how many approach shots do you actually hit on a hole? from between, let's say, 90 and 130 yards. It's a lot of them. So you want your precision in there. So instead of just having to, after your pitching wedge, sand wedge, and then straight into a putter, get a lob wedge in there, get a gap wedge in there. I carry five wedges, ridiculously, including my pitching wedge. But that's because on most courses I play, if I hit a reasonable tee shot, I'm within 140 yards. That's all wedges in that area for me. I want that precision. And the important thing as well from fitting and when you're going out and buying those wedges, don't just look at the loft on the bottom. 
because what you ultimately want with your wedges is a spread of distances that you can carry it. So buy them on the distances you want to hit, whatever yardage, uh, whatever degrees you need for that to be. So you've got a nice spread, say 120, 110, 190. Yeah, hundred percent agree, Kit. Obviously, with drivers getting longer as well, that's only going to create more need to have more wedges in your bag, cover off more of those distances, as you say. You know, golf courses around where we play, they're pretty short, and uh, you know, wedge wedge distances. Those of you scoring shots, you need to have them covered off. So, hundred percent, great shout, Kit. Great shout. So, I'm going to my next gear trend is around drivers again, but this time it's around the fact that drivers are really getting or the brands are having a bigger focus on forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've seen, not that brands are maxed out in terms of distance, but there are obviously a lot of rules when it comes to the, you know, the COR and the spring-like effect to the face. And we're seeing brands have a really big focus towards, well, how can I get the weight in a more desirable place within this driver to make it more forgiving? We've seen some pretty drastic designs this year, you know, tailor-made Sim 2 with this, with its ring construction and the carbon sole panels top and bottom is a classic example of moving mass in a quite drastic way to make the, the club heads more stable, more forgiving. And while you might think, well, that's actually not really going to help me in terms of getting more distance, actually on an average of a wide selection of shots out on the course, your average distance probably will increase over time. So, you know, while the shots out of the middle won't go that much further, you know, on a, on a wider shot pattern, you should see your average distance increase. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, as an amateur golfer, I'm not hitting the majority of my shots out the middle. So I want something that goes f- as long as possible, a little bit further away from the sweet spot. And also the absence of adjustability, which we're seeing more and more these days is enabling that weight to be manipulated in a better way to create even greater forgiveness. Uh, I'm all for more forgiveness. If you look at my shot dispersion anyway, with the driver, don't need distance, need accuracy. I think uh, we can all do it with a bit more forgiveness, <laughs> Kit, on our drive, exactly. let's be honest. Uh, my next one kind of plays into what I alluded to a little bit before about currently in the UK, we're in a lockdown, golf courses are closed. It, it's been quite a, a previous 12 months in terms of that. More people have been stuck at home and that has really resulted in a boom in training aids and kind of at home practice facilities, if you like, people getting nets and mats that they can use at home, indoor putting stuff. And that is going to increase this year where there is demand the manufacturers and producers will fill it in. There's been a massive demand for these things that allow you to play and practice golf at home. And I think we're going to see more sophistication in what's available in the coming months as the uncertainty continues. And frankly, people just decide, do you know what? It's nice having a net in the garden or a little room, perhaps in the spare room where I can go and hit some putts. Uh, And it's going to help my golf even when we can get out on golf courses. So I think you can expect to see more and better training aids, nets, at-home setups that you can perhaps get yourself and they might become more affordable as well. 100% kit. Uh, We've seen some big traffic on our website in terms of posts around the best putting mats, the best practice nets. Um, So there's clearly a greater demand from that. And we're seeing more and more of those simulator rooms, as you say, um, being being sold and put into Instagram is full of pictures of people who've put up their own home studios. Some of them look really good, some of them not so good. But if if it's a choice between that or not playing golf at all, I think that you know it's a good option that a lot of people are taking up. So very good kit. Uh, my next one though is about graphite shafts in irons. Now this you know, this kind of comes and goes as a talking point in golf, but. You know, last year we saw Bryson DeChambeau win the US Open with 14 graphite shafted clubs in his back, which is unheard of, you know, especially in the putter category. Um, and we're seeing more and more players now sneakily switching into graphite irons. So obviously we know, you know, Brant Snedeker and Matt Kuchar had them in for a while. Um, but we've got, you know, Abraham, Abraham Anser has got graphite shafts in his irons. And even Ricky Fowler now um, has switched into graphite shafted irons. So I think they're... M- they're seeing the benefit of, well, there's multiple benefits. You know, I've tested graphite shafts in irons and I think they're higher launching. They're, I found the dispersion came in and they're just a lot less hard work. You know, steel shafts, if you're not swinging well, which I often aren't, can be quite hard work, especially if you've got been fitted into quite a heavy option. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like they're easy to swing, especially if you're a tour pro and you're hitting a lot of golf balls 
that lighter feel um, is really going to help your longevity. And actually, the flex profile of a graphite shaft these days is very similar to a steel. So it's not like you, you, the, the preconceptions of graphite shafts are they're really light, they're going to go really high, spin loads, and they're not going to be for faster swingers. But actually, you know, the profile of these shafts can be very closely matched to what you get in steel. So I think we're going to see a lot more players. Uh, benefiting from graphite shafts in their irons. Yeah, the more we see it on tour as well, the more it normalizes it for us amateur golfers. There's, you know, golf so much about ego. We don't want to be the guy with the graphite shafts because the steel are seen as, as what you should have. Graphite shafts are for, you know, juniors and seniors. But I think the more we see it on tour, the more people that genuinely need the benefit of having a graphite shaft and their golf will improve from it, will feel more comfortable going down that route at their local golf club. Um, another one is, is something that's kind of started from tour and is bleeding into the amateur game. And that's the expansion of wearable technology. Information is power in anything and, and certainly in golf. And these days you can get things like Arcos and ShotScope, which you can wear yourself and attach to your clubs and you have an app with it. And it tells you everything that you need to know about your golf game. You can get your strokes gained data. You can find out how far on average I hit my seven iron when I'm actually on the course playing for real. Take that information a step further and you can get facilities to give you a caddy that will say, looking at the hole and your statistics and how far you hit the ball, your accuracy percentages, this is what you should hit off the tee and this will leave you this club in. It can take out all of the stuff that you get as a pro on the tour. You've got a caddy, you've got technicians, stats people telling you exactly what you should be doing and where you should be improving. And now as a golfer with a handicap, we can get that as well. You chuck in things that we're hearing all about, like whoop. I don't know if, you know, I had a little look at this recently. I thought every golfer's got one. I need to know what this is. And, you know, it just monitors everything about what your body's doing, your heart rate, your recovery, tells you during a round of golf, after a round of golf. And if you really want to take your game to the nth degree and, and find out the best time to improve yourself whether you're recovering where you're getting stressed on a golf course all that information if you can process it in the right way is going to help you 100 percent, kit i think these types of technologies are the future of golf that data driven performance analysis you know provides really really good insights into your strengths and weaknesses you know especially in terms of evaluating your club performance as well um, I think more and more people should be definitely taking into account these sorts of things because they are really helpful. And, and Whoop is a really good example. Yeah, it's the official wearable of the PJ Tour. So clearly, you know, they see the benefit of it. And I think it's really good at understanding how you handle pressure situations. You know, was your heart rate elevated too much or did you actually handle it quite well? And then it's also about your recovery isn't it, as well, you, your sleep quality and things like that and how you recover from stressful rounds on the situation. So yeah, I think that's only going to become more prolific in the game of golf kit. So yeah, absolutely agree with you on that one. Just um, gonna... on the club fitting side there as well, but also from a teaching perspective, if you can go to your club fitter or your teaching pro, show them the shots you've been hitting and where you've been going wrong, it enables them to, to help you in, in so much an easier and better way as well. So I'm going to move on from tech to footwear in my next gear trend. And I think, we're definitely going to see, we tend to see it every year, but it seems to have been, especially the case this year, a trend towards more sporty, athletic style golf shoes. I think you know, the day of the golf only shoe is pretty much gone. Golfers now, they're looking for a bit more bang for their buck. They want a golf shoe that they can wear in a few more different situations, I think, whether it's just to and from the course and in the clubhouse afterwards, or maybe other situations as well. I'm going to hold my hands up here, Kit, and say I wear golf shoes for a lot of other things outside of golf. So I started doing a bit of running and I'm wearing a pair of Skechers golf shoes for that. Uh, when I go out walking, like in, when it's muddy, I'll sometimes wear golf shoes because they've got good grip, they've got good stability and they're waterproof. I mean, they tick all the boxes. Um, and we are seeing a trend towards more sporty star shoes. We've seen, you know, Footjoy Hyperflex's new shoe, very sporty, athletic. The Adidas ZG21 is also a classic example of that. And I think people are more and more looking for that versatility from their golf shoes just to get a bit more value for money. And, and so far from what we've seen, there's definitely a trend towards that. I'm all for anything that means I'm not changing my shoes all the time. I'm in favour of that. I've got visions of you, Joel, being that guy that he wears 
you're going home from the golf, you need to pick something up from the shop. You're in there in your golf shoes, but you've also got the glove hanging out the back pocket as you walk through Tesco's. I think that's you all day long. <laughs> I've definitely done that a couple of times, no question. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've not done any practice swings, but you know, the glove in the Grabbing back pocket. Baguette, I'm guilty red of that. aisle and just checking where. <laughs> checking the swing plane. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, oh, um, I'm sure you've done it as well, Kit. So come on, tell me your next one. Uh, yeah, I've definitely done it. Uh, I'm jumping in. Uh, combo iron sets, which is something I really love. Why would you not want more forgiveness in your long irons, but without giving up? that little bit of precision and feel in your shorter irons. It makes perfect sense. Now, you've been able to do it for a while, but certainly I think in 2021, the manufacturers and more importantly, the retailers are kind of jumping on this a little bit more. So in terms of the manufacturers, there's more ranges that are designed with mixing and matching these combo sets in mind. I think Callaway's new Apex range does it. Taylor made are doing a pretty good job at that as well. And then from a retailer point of view, there's far more flexibility when you're going in to purchase them um, and also when you're being fitted. It's very much at the forefront of the agenda now. You can get a combo iron set and it's not like you have to go to some specialist retailer or find somewhere where you can just buy four of one set and five of another separately or whatever it may be. They're definitely better for golfers and they're now easier to get hold of. Yep, 100% agree, Kit. I, I myself use... A combo set uh, as you say i think the greater number of models within each range afford you the opportunity to do it and there's people out there who say our oh, combo sets reduce the resale value so therefore i'm not going to buy it but surely it's more valuable to have the right club in the right position in your bag to give you the best performance so i think that should override everything and i think we're going to see more of that this year so okay so my next one kit is eco-friendly clothing not just clothing, actually, I'm going to broaden it a bit to just golf equipment. So, yeah, I think not just in golf, but in life generally, we're having a greater focus on sustainability, right? So reducing our carbon footprint, whether it's recycling, you know, cycling instead of walking, water usage, switching to clean energy suppliers. You know, there's a lot of ways that we can do it outside of golf. But in golf, there are ways we can reduce our impact on the environment. And we're seeing more and more brands really embracing that you know we've seen you know adidas partnering with parley for oceans are so using recycled plastic from the, the coastline and making it into shoes and clothing puma have just launched their new tracks um apparel range made from recycled plastic gavin green have got an insular pullover made of 17 uh plastic bottles and there's other brands that are, you know recycled um bottles used to make golf bags from sun mountain so I think yeah, this is something that brands are always going to be wanting to shout about. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more examples in 2021 of products made from recycled materials. Yeah, tees as well. You mentioned it goes beyond clothing. Now you can get bamboo tees, um, which, of course, loads of bamboo in the world, no plastic. Uh, anything I think we can do as human beings, never mind golfers, to help make uh, the planet more sustainable uh, and leave it in as good a condition as we can for future generations uh, I think we should absolutely be doing so it's great to see the efforts going towards that from a lot of golf manufacturers um, okay my final one uh, I'm going really techy on this uh, it's 3d printing um, so Cobra brought out in November or, or announced in November this completely 3d printed putter which is incredible when you think about it I mean you can put a design into a computer and then it just gets created in its entirety by a printer there in front of your very eyes but the implications for what this could mean in golf are pretty huge actually um, it allows testing to be done far quicker and far cheaper ideas can be made into something physical that can be tested and then also when it comes to the final product of golf clubs you're going to buy things can be made stronger and lighter Joel, you've already mentioned how important being able to manipulate weight and strength and move it around a club head is in every club as drivers of course for making them more forgiving but right through the bag you can improve the performance of a golf club if you can make it stronger and lighter essentially 3d printing will allow testing to be done quicker and will allow end products to be more effective so i think cobra have started the ball rolling and we're going to see all of the manufacturers and as i'm sure they already are behind the scenes jumping on that bandwagon and seeing how they can apply it to improve the golf clubs they bring to us 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, this isn't a completely new concept in golf. You know, Ping had a putter that was 3D printed a few years ago, but it, it never really took off, And which I'm surprised about because the concept makes perfect sense in golf. You know, golf club heads are very intricate and very small changes can make a big difference to the performance and the way they're designed. There are limitations in terms of access to certain parts of the club head. Um, when you're making, you know, a driver that, that needs to be strong and, you know, hit the ball and, and sustain, you know, quite a lot of pressure. So, yeah, I definitely think we're going to see 3D printing branching out, not just putters, but other clubs, uh, you know, and different areas of the bag. So, yeah, watch this space on that one. Um, well, so my final one, Kit, uh, moving from clubs is, is into golf balls. And specifically, mm -hmm. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more consistency from your golf ball this year. I mean, I'm not saying that golf balls last year were inconsistent, but brands are having a really big focus on getting their aerodynamic consistencies spot on and also their manufacturing as well. So, you know, we've seen Callaway uh, in, uh, invest $50 million into their Chicopee ball plant. This wasn't this year, admittedly, but I just think brands are having a, a lot more focus on, on this area of performance. Your tight list just changed their dimple pattern on the Pro V1 they haven't done it since 2011. Um, you know, this is the number one ball in golf. So this is quite a significant change um, that Titleist say are going to make it more consistent through the end. You know, there's nothing worse than thinking you've hit a good shot and it not flying the way you want to. And I think regardless of what brand you choose, you should be rewarded from your good shots this year with a more consistent ball flight. Yeah, the other one that you didn't mention is Wilson bringing out the ball with no paint on it as well, which I think is fascinating. I've actually tried it. It's a good ball. Um, I, I couldn't really perceive too many differences while using it against the painted version, but hey, incremental gains, and I'm sure a better golfer than me could. But to see the innovation, uh, I think it is key from these brands. So yeah, I think we are going to see a lot more focus and a lot more talk about consistency of balls, not just distance and spin rates in the marketing we see as well. Brilliant. Well, that's it, Kit. I think that's us done. That's 12 of the hottest equipment trends you're going to be seeing in 2021. Uh, if you like the video, make sure you do click the like button and comment down the video. Have we missed anything uh, from our trends? Is there something else that we're going to be seeing this year that we've not covered? Hopefully not. But, uh, you know, if we have missed one, do let us know. Um, but Kit, thanks for that. Thanks, Joel. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, absolute pleasure. And uh, thanks for everyone for watching. We'll see you next time.